Good evening. Welcome, everyone. I am Saba Jemfi, and I will serve as tonight's facilitator of our conversation. On behalf of Metro, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you here. We do want to talk about safety because safety is a priority here at Metro. So for those who are in the room, I want to draw your attention to the back room where there's a glass door and also another glass door on my left to your right. In the event there is an emergency, you can access any of those doors to leave this room. Make a left and you'll have access to the stairwell to obviously leave the, the building. Now, if the elevators are functional, you can also take the elevators. It's also to the left and there is a corridor where the restrooms are as well and you can take one level down. So as I said before, thank you so much for joining us. This is the first of a series of community events that we're having for the Western Bus Garage. And we are so excited to have this with you because we're starting from scratch. This is basically from the ground up with you. And this is an opportunity for us to engage and get your feedback, ask those questions, and to really help build the community and make something that's gonna be really special for this project. Next slide, please. Now, this is a hybrid event, meaning that there are people in person and also with us virtually. So I want to go through some housekeeping items before we start. For those who are in the room, we are going to have a Q&A session at the end of the meeting. We will have microphone representatives on each side of the room. When you're ready to ask your question, raise your hand and a mic rep will come to you with the microphone. For attendees joining us virtually, there are various ways that you can ask your questions. First being, you can put your name in chat, and once your name is in the chat, we will acknowledge you, and then you can go off mute and ask your question. If you don't feel comfortable asking your question, you can put it in chat, and then someone will uh, say that for you on your behalf. You can also use the raised hand feature. So what you see at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions emoji. Click on that, and then you'll see the raised hand feature, and you'll be able to um, let everyone know you want to ask a question. We'll say your name. You can go off mute and also ask your question there. Thank you. Next slide. So that everyone's aware of the gist of tonight's meeting, I want to run through the agenda with you. So we'll start off with introductions, and then we'll also talk about the background about this project, and then we'll lead with some information around the rehabilitation program for our buses followed by the future garage and next steps for this project. We'll talk about community engagement. And then, like I said before, we'll end with Q&A. Before we begin with introductions, there are a few people that we want to shout out tonight. And I want to start off with Dr. Tracy Lowe, who's our Ramada Board of Director, Principal Member. Thank you for joining. And also Tom Quinn, who's our ANC3E Commissioner. I also want to acknowledge Springworth, who is our DC alternate for the board. Thank you. And last but not least, we have council member Fruman of Ward 3. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Next slide, please. So for the panelists, the people who will be speaking today, again, I'm Saba Jemfi, I'm the communications specialist. I am joined by Ray Alfred, who's the vice president of bus maintenance, and Liz Price, who's the vice president of real estate and development. So I would like to welcome Ray. Thank you, Saba. And thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight um, for this first meeting about Western Bus Garage and, and what we would like to get your input on uh, for it. I've been a part of this community for quite some time. Uh, garage uh, originally opened in 1936, as you see here on the slide. Uh, rail station in 1984 uh, and uh, development there with the uh, bus loop uh, to Wisconsin Circle uh, in 1984 as well as part of the opening of the, uh, course, uh, excuse me, the uh, Metro Rail Station. Over the course of COVID, of course, we've been significantly impacted, decreases in, in uh, revenue, in ridership and revenue. Um, however, uh, rail is still starting to come back, especially since we've increased uh, service there. And since, since the pandemic, during the pandemic, bus has largely been back to some, some level of normalcy. 
uh, and just really shows how important the Metro bus service is to the, to the region. Next slide. So specific to this uh, community, um, uh, the garage is, is, and I think the slides are just a little bit out of order. Is this, was there a previous slide? All right, well, let's go ahead then. So Western uh, supports uh, a lot in this community. Um, the D routes, the 30s, the H line, uh, the D routes, when I say the D routes, a lot of the school service, the school but, uh, Metro bus service that we offer in this area comes out all out of Metro, uh, out of the Western bus garage. Here on the um, uh, slide now, on the, on the screen now, depicts what Western looks like. And again, it, it really, it serves a large part of the uh, local community, a large part of the city. It's critical to Metro bus, uh, Metro bus service in, in, the, uh, in DC. Part of the problem that we are faced with at Western is that it does not allow for expansion and growth as we continue to, as we start to evolve last week, uh, for those who may have been a part of the Northern uh, bus, bus uh, garage discussion, you, you heard there both at that uh, meeting as well as the uh, public announcement by uh, Randy Clark, our, our GM, that we will be taking that garage 100% uh, zero emission. As we start going down that path uh, towards zero emission buses, this current facility just doesn't allow for that, allow for in, in terms of spacing and, and, uh, and the like. Can you go ahead and go to the next slide. Man? So, you know, again, the bus garage itself is about 90 years old. Um, the parking, the parking alone is not efficient whatsoever. It makes us prone to accidents, unfortunately. Uh, a normal person cannot fit in between the space uh, that is allowed for on that particular parking lot. Uh, no support at all for us to be able to, uh, to be able to support zero emission buses and what's going to be required from that from the infrastructure necessary to upgrade the facility. Um, and, and then also um, are probably one of our most valuable resources, our, empl our employees just don't have the conditions in that 90 year old facility to be able to uh, decompress, uh, to, to say it best. Um, next slide. So in, in addition to North, to Western, we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, work going on at Northern uh, to rehabilitate that one, that, that location being our oldest, our oldest bus garage, bus garage, and we will be transi transitioning that to a zero emission facility. Bladensburg bus garage also uh, in the midst of a construction project, which will include a large portion of zero emission and eventually um, getting to that point as well. Western is, is again, just a, our next step in that growth and in, in, in our evolution. So finally, with zero emission buses and, and trying to choose my words carefully, you know, at the end of the day, we want to take this to a zero emission facility as well. Um, again, there's not much that we can share at this point because we are very, very early in this process. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Liz to talk a little bit more about what we what we are envisioning or what we want to what we are exploring uh, thus far. Um, but the key thing that I want to that, that some questions that came up at the northern meeting when I say zero emission, no diesel, no CNG, you know, think think electric, although it can evolve into other technologies as well. Okay. So I'll pass it off to Liz at this point. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Martin, this... did you add a cherry berry? <laughs> I thought it was my echo, but that's not it. <laughs> uh, good evening, Liz Price, Vice President of Real Estate and Development. Um, so a little bit about our office since um, we're not an operational unit, so some um, folks may not be familiar with us. Um, our office manages WMATA's real estate assets, so that's everything from parking lots and garages to bus loops, as well as land, undeveloped land around our stations. Um, another one of our goals is to promote private development at our stations on property that we own, so housing, retail office, and hotels, and we do that through a process called joint development. Over the last nearly 50 years, WMATA has, um, in partnership with developers, sold and leased land uh, to private developers to 
develop other uses at our stations, which have totaled about 17 million square feet at 30 stations around the region. These projects generate millions of new annual riders for our system, but also importantly, um, nearly $200 million in annual state and local taxes um, to the local jurisdictions. Our office's role in the Western Bus Garage Replacement Project is um, multifaceted. Um, we will be leading the acquisition of any property that's needed to support the project. Uh, we'll also be exploring the opportunities for housing and retail as part of the new garage. We will lead the future redevelopment of the current Western Bus Garage site on Wisconsin Avenue. Uh, and together with many others, uh, other partners at Metro will be coordinating the design and development very carefully with the district and the local community. Next slide. As Ray mentioned, the Western Bus Garage has been an important part of this community for many years. Uh, it's done its purpose, it's served its time, um, but it's at the end of its useful life. And WMATA has to determine that it is not feasible to rebuild a new garage at this location. As Ray also outlined, the current configuration with open air bus parking cannot accommodate zero emission buses today or in the future in its current configuration. And while we expect the new garage to be a structured garage, not open air, um, the size and, and odd configure, unusual configuration or uneven configuration of this site um, make it very inefficient um, for the future garage. In addition, um, building on the current site would require WMATA to relocate all of these buses, 117 buses, to another location while we build a new facility and bring them back, and that raises um, significant costs and operational impacts. And finally, um, because of the constraints we mentioned, uh, it would be difficult to incorporate other uses like housing on this site uh, if the garage were to remain. Slide. <clears throat> Over a period of many years, WMATA has evaluated a number of other locations uh, and considered a number of other sites for the future garage and determined that most of them were not suitable for the future garage. Some were located too far away from the core routes, which uh, increased what we call non-revenue bus trips, known as deadheading which increases costs and can have impacts on service. Some other sites, <clears throat> excuse me, were federally owned or are federally owned or have complex permitting requirements or other um, sensitive environmental conditions that were just not suited for this use. Next slide. WMATA has identified the Lord and Taylor site, uh, the vacant, um, the former Lord and Taylor site, which is now vacant as the best location for the future garage. And the board authorized the acquisition of the site last year. The larger size and the uniform shape supports a more efficient layout and can accommodate the future zero emission charging um, that we are anticipating. Construction can also occur while operations remain on the current site. Um, our intent would be to build a new garage um, and continue to operate at the existing garage um, until the new site is ready. And so there could be a, we hope, a seamless transition from one to the other with uh, minimal impacts to operations. And finally, um, the, the new, the Lord and Taylor site, we believe could allow for redevelopment, um, incorporate other uses on the site potentially, which we'll be exploring in the next phase of work. And also it allows us to redevelop our current site on Wisconsin Avenue um, for mixed use development. Next slide. So as you can expect with any project of this scale and complexity and at the early stage that we are, there's still a lot of issues to be worked out and we'll be talking about um, ways you can engage with that um, from here on out. Um, one key, one key um, issue, of course, is to finalize the site acquisition. Uh, we're in negotiations with the property owner, and because of that, we can't say a whole lot more tonight, but it, uh, when we're able, we will, um, but we have engaged in that process uh, directly. We are um, also um, going to be evaluating opportunities and, and, and um, issues around site access, how buses as well as cars and pedestrians uh, would access the site in the future, uh, as well as um, addressing the historic nomination. Some of you may be aware uh, that a nomination was filed um, to make the building um, historic or nominated as a historic uh, on the historic registry. Uh, the district has not made any decision or hasn't taken this up yet, but obviously will be something considered um, in the coming uh, time as we plan for this project. And then, of course, funding um, a project of the scale is going to um, be involve a lot of different sources, federal as well as WMATA sources, and those funding streams will be confirmed as we move forward. Uh, and throughout this, we'll be looking for community input. Next slide. 
So again, early days, so it's hard to, to put numbers on things and dates on things, but we're doing our best to give you a sense of where we're headed. Um, we're obviously kicking off community engagement tonight. Um, over the next couple of weeks and months, we'll be uh, very much focused on finalizing WMATA's technical uh, facility requirements, what has to be in the garage, what we need to be able to bring to this community um, a 21st century um, bus facility. And then translating that into concept designs that we'll be bringing back to the community for consideration. Uh, and then, of course, uh, acquiring the site. Uh, over the next two years, um, the Historic Preservation Board, we expect will take up this uh, nomination and make a decision. Uh, we will also be submitting um, documentation for the NEPA review, which is an environmental, a federal environmental review for this project, as well as uh, rezoning the site and confirming funding and design. And then we think in the 26 to 2030 timeframe, um, this project could move forward to construction um, and possibly include other uses. Um, and at that same time, we would be engaging a developer for the current site at Wisconsin Avenue so that that project can proceed, that development could proceed uh, as soon as possible once WMATA ends its operations at Wisconsin Avenue. Next slide. So this just drills down a little bit um, in more finely grained to give you a sense of what to expect over the next year. Um, we expect to be back quarterly with meetings like this, both in person and virtual, to share updates with you. Uh, the next meeting, we will be bringing concept designs um, that think about you know, how our bus garage could, could um, fit on the site and what are the opportunities and challenges and to get feedback um, with the hope that we're gonna finalize a preferred concept this summer. And then in the fall and the winter, um, the historic review and NEPA reviews would be happening um, and all the work we do this year will be leading up to that. Um, throughout all of this, the DC Office of Planning, which is here tonight, Erkin's here, thank you. Um, a lot of work is happening around us. The Wisconsin Avenue Development Framework is underway and we're coordinating closely with them and them with us, uh, as well as with other district government agencies, as well as Montgomery County, because the site is obviously on the border. And so we're coordinating across jurisdictions. Next slide. I think that's it. And uh, Saba, you're going to come back and talk about how people can stay connected. Metro remains committed to keeping our community engaged throughout this project's life cycle. There are two ways that we're going to be doing that. The first being that we're going to bring project awareness to the community. And we're going to do that through our, pro our project website. So essentially the project website will have all the up-to-date information about the project, where we stand, and an opportunity for you to also engage us by signing up for our e-newsletters. You'll also see collateral on the website as well. And then we're also going to be engaging people through digital means. So that means social media where we'll have the ability to share information very quickly um, and disperse that amongst the community. And then the second way that we are going to help bring awareness and to really drive communication between us and the community is by ensuring that we have a collaborative design to engage everyone. And we're going to do that through community outreach. So we have our quarterly workshops that we'll have. We'll share and evaluate concept options. We'll also gather and respond to feedback that we're collecting from the community. And then we will provide information on our selected and preferred concept. Next slide, please. So the section of this conversation I'm sure so many of us are excited about is the Q&A session. And so I just want to go through a few housekeeping items again before we, be, before we start our Q&A session. For those who are in person, if you want to speak, please raise your hand. We do have runners who will be um, going through each section of the room to pass the mic. I just ask that if you have personal belong belongings, just be careful where they are because we don't want anyone to trip or fall. And for those who are online, again, virtual, you can do a couple of things. First, you can type your name in chat. Once someone says your name and acknowledges you, you can come off of mute and you can also ask your question, or you can use the raise hand feature that you see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, where you can um, indicate that you wanna speak, someone will acknowledge your name, and then you can, again, go off mute and speak. If you do not feel comfortable speaking, you can also type your uh, question in chat and then we will say that question on your behalf. At the end of the meeting, for those who are in the room, we're going to have thematic boards across the room. So if you think of anything after the Q&A session and you want to ask the question or give feedback, you can stick sticky notes on that board. And after this meeting, everyone's going to receive a thank you email 
you will have the option of, again, asking any questions and our team will respond. So I will allow our, our microphone representatives to choose a section, and then we'll start with our in-person. We'll take a couple of in-person questions, and then we're going to go online for any, anyone who has that. Liz, I, I'd like to just ask a quick question. If you could go back to the slide with where you uh, traced the shape on the Lord and Taylor property, because it looks like mm -hmm you are not including the parking to the to the right of the building if you're in front of lord and taylor's are you including the entire site or just up to the edge of the building the intent was to show the full footprint of it's about 6.2 okay. so, acres so my question is since it's since the western i'm on the transportation management district in montgomery county uh, from the pccsa it's in brookdale neighborhood and so my question that i raised at a tmd meeting uh, when there was a metro person there is uh, since the Western bus garage serves multiple purposes, right? It's a parking lot, it's a maintenance facility, and I learned today it's also wash and fuel. <laughs> but in a, in a, obviously, you'd only need wash if it's electric. So my question is, right now, you're on 44th Street, and you want to give Wisconsin back to retail and multi-use. The Lloyd and Taylor site is in the middle of a residential neighborhood and the Western Bus Garage is no less appropriate there than it is on Wisconsin Avenue. And to me, it would seem like get a developer, go in with a, to secure the property of Lord and Taylor, and you should be on both sides of 44th Street because many of your employees use the park along 44th Street so that the people that are going to that retail there can't park on 44th Street because it's taken by employees of the Western Bus Garage. And in fact, a couple of people are always parked in the gated entrance to the Lord and Taylor lot where there are no meters. So it would seem to me that you should use both sides of 44th Street so that part of the Lord and Taylor lot can go to residential and Wisconsin can go to multi-use. And you could have parking on one side, maybe even give your employees parking, and on the other side have the, the maintenance facility in the garage. That, that's a question I have. I don't know if it's feasible. But we're the developer that might do the two development parts, right? You'll have more money to convince the owners of the property to sell you the property. That's my question. Yeah, thank comment. you for the comment. It's definitely the kind of comment we'll be thinking about in the next phase, which is concept design, um, which will be driven um, first and foremost by what Ray's team tells us they need uh, for their buses in the future and then how best to service them and then what else we can do um, around that. So I think um, we're headed into that phase and when we come back, we'll have more thoughts about how that might work. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. We have a question right behind you, Sharon. My name is Jim Curtin. Uh, I live at 4405 Garrison, which is only a block away. Um, I know it's early days, but what are you thinking about in terms of protecting impact on the uh, residences on Harrison, Garrison, and the other surrounding streets? Yeah, I, what I would say is that, um, as you said, it's early days, so we're, we're gonna be coming back with some concepts that think about all kinds of impacts, both you know, neighborhood traffic design, um, and we'll be looking for your feedback. So I would say, stay connected to us, and then come back to the next meeting. We'll have more to share. Uh, I'd like to step back a minute. You you said that um, it's not feasible to use the existing space. Could you elaborate on why it's not feasible? So with the electric with the electric buses, um, there's there's a lot of infrastructure that's going to be required. Transformers. Um, uh, what we are what a design that we've been looking at is uh, pantograph style chargers, which will it, it, pantograph style chargers, which will come from the top down. It requires a gantry system, so there's a big structure that has to be built above the facility. And because of the spacing right now, it just it does not allow for maintaining the service level that needs to come out of Western, as well as getting the zero emission infrastructure. 
best site is Lauren Taylor, and I don't have I don't don't have a second. Uh, I wouldn't want to wouldn't want to qualify all the other runners up. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Dominic Ralchik asks, uh, "Would you like to avoid? They would like to avoid an entrance and egress onto Western, which impacts houses. Uh, can they come in and out on Jennifer?" and on 43rd as they do now again that's important and helpful feedback um, we'll be looking at access issues as we move into concept design so um, again i think we'll have more to consider on this as in the next meeting thank you i saw some hands raised you're confronting here both one of the toughest planning challenges, which is how to cite industrial facilities within a essentially a residential slash commercial neighborhood. So what you do here could be really spectacular if you can do it. I'm just wondering uh, where in the rest of the world are you looking for breakthrough technologies, breakthrough design concepts that's a great question. I'll let you answer the technical side. I, on the on the design side, um, you're right. This is very challenging um, to do um, to bring other uses like housing uh, above an active uh, garage of this scale. In fact, um, there's only one in the U.S. that is uh, it's not built, but it's being designed in San Francisco, and we are talking to them regularly. They're a few steps ahead of us, so we're hoping they're going to learn all the lessons, and we're going to benefit. Um, there are some examples abroad, um, but it is very challenging, both structurally, physically, to accommodate those kinds of uses, also financially, um, to make that work. So we um, we are looking to others to learn, um, but there's not a whole lot out there on the design kind of structural side. I'll let you talk about the technology side. Sure. So um, we we you know we are active participants in in APTA, which is the trade the trade industry for the trade agency for um, organization for uh, transit service. Uh, in addition to folks in in Europe that that have done some of these things before, uh, we're, we're looking all over the U.S. Um, in fact, just just returned from a visit to Minnesota just to see some of their enclosed facilities and how they're doing it. Um, uh, it's, it's just it's still developing as we talk about zero emission, how we transition, how we transit in, transition it in the right way um, and, and, and with the goal of, of keeping the service running, being successful, making sure we're getting people from point A to point B. We have a question right here. Hi, I live about a block from Coastal. Um, I would just like to get some clarity on a couple of items. Um, can, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Just trying to get some clarity on a couple of items. Um, I think I might have heard you allude to the garage being underground. Is, is, is that in fact a plan for to have the garage underground? We haven't, I mean, that'll be something we'll be looking at in the next phase. Um, we, have, we have said that we think it will be more than one story um, because of the various things that Ray alluded to in terms of the charging infrastructure and the layout needs, um, but we have not made a de determination about what would be underground or not. Okay, so it sounds like it's possibly above ground. <clears throat> then in addition to that, um, there was a bullet point that said that it would be zero, a zero emission facility, um, but it didn't say whether or not the buses would be zero emission mm -hmm. on day one. How, how would that work? So on day one, zero emission. On day one, no diesel, no CNG, no no buses, no vehicles with emissions coming Can out. Can we go back to that slide? Because no I think the open? slide, I just want to make sure the slide is. Um, I was looking at the slide here, so I might. It will open. Yeah, I think the last bullet, yeah, it will open as 100% zero emission. Yeah, so, so. Facility, a facility, that's why I was getting clarity on. It'll be a zero emission facility, but will the buses be zero emission? Right. No. So I'm confirming that that means there will be no buses. And then unlike uh, the Northern, where we discussed last week taking out diesel infrastructure, this is being designed with no diesel infrastructure in it. Uh, great. So. Moment it opens, zero emission buses is what I heard. That that is our intent. That is our intent. When we are, we are going to work towards exactly that, it will not have any diesel designed into it whatsoever. Thank you. Go. And and one more too, and that is, 
there's the lot that we all in the neighborhood call the home plate lot. At least the lot between, you know, we're talking yeah. about Western and Jennifer and behind the Mazda Gallery. And um, I, I must say that um, pushing the bus arrives further into the, the community it is not an, uh, it's not something I could really support. Um, so I have to ask in relation to the other sites that have been looked at, but the home plate lot didn't appear on uh, one of the alternatives you looked at. So I'd like to hear about um, your consideration of the home plate lot and how that played out. Yeah, I think it wasn't on there because it just isn't big enough um, to, to support um, our use. So it's just, it's, it's much smaller. Sure, and, and in the vein of hearing what the community would like to have, um, there would be the possibility though of keeping the bus garage where it is, acquiring the home plate lot and possibly having obviously more space than you have right now. Um, so that is that is an idea. And we didn't really hear much about the Geico lot and why that didn't seem to work. And thank you. Did we hear about that? Um, the Geico site was looked at a few years ago. Um, there is a you know there's an office uh, an office user there um, and there was um, it was determined it was not a good fit as well. Do we have a question in the back? Yes, thank you. Um, Geico, I mean, the Geico lot is not used. I mean, largely, it's probably 90% empty all the time. And, well, and they may never. So that's one, I, I think that's worth looking at. But also, I was at a meeting a couple days ago in which somebody mentioned that buses actually don't go up Wisconsin into Maryland. Uh, they just, it's basically DC. And the, the, the recommendation was, why doesn't Metro run its buses into Maryland? And if you do that, and it makes sense to me, number one. Number two, if you do that, does that mean you may need more space uh, than you're budgeting for for this site? So, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to pivot to Al, Al Himes with our planning department. They can talk, share a little bit more information about how the planned routes are actually going. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, yeah, I, I'm Al Himes. I'm the director of bus service planning and scheduling for Metro. Um, so great question on the buses going into Maryland. Um, we're going to be back out in the public in the spring about our bus network redesign project, and that's some of the things that we're talking about in that project. So uh, would love to see you at those meetings um, when we have those meetings on the bus network redesign, because we're very excited about that project. Um, as far as um, the need for additional buses, um, this particular location here, we're looking at the same, uh, about the same number of buses at the current facility here, we're, we're, as part of the bus network redesign, we're not looking to increase the volume of buses here at this site. Thank you. We have a question in the back. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Is it on? Yes, yeah, thanks. Uh, Jim Curtin again. Um, I appreciate what you've been saying about uh, the Lord and Taylor lot and that being maybe where you're concentrating your attention, but picking up on what some of the other people have raised. Um, I mean, these are Metro buses, right? They're not DC. It's not the DC bus line. It's the Metro bus line. And we've got a lot of open space around that intersection, including the Geico parking lot including what uh, was referred to as the, the home plate lot, which that, that's, I, I take it, that's that piece of property that's a parking lot now where that uh, Goodwill kind of donation truck is parked. And there's the, uh, I'll call it the radio station office building, um, kind of right on Jennifer and 44th there. Um, which is not owned by whoever owns Lord and Taylor. It's obviously owned by somebody else. But if, if that piece of the puzzle were deemed uh, a useful piece, I mean, the city does have eminent domain power to acquire it if it couldn't purchase it. 
um, like it does when it builds ballparks and other public kind of amenities. So I guess, I, I mean, I'm hearing you say that you've almost decided that the Lord and Taylor property is gonna be the site, but I'm not really hearing why some of these other pieces couldn't be useful pieces of maybe a, a differently configured or imagined site that would maybe solve some of the uh, issues of encroaching too much on the residential neighborhood and might even provide better access for buses to get in and out of the neighborhood uh, on, on Western and Friendship Boulevard and some of those other pieces of property. I mean, I, I assume that you guys have been looking at all that and maybe have sort of at the end of a torturous path concluded it's got to be the Lord and Taylor site and nothing else. And if, if that's the answer, I think we, we'd we like to hear kind of more of the homework of that because uh, it sounds a little bit like, you know, you just kind of pick the spot and said it's going to be Lord and Taylor and we're not quite sure why the other pieces don't work. Yeah, I, I can say that, um, you know, it, it's been many years that the, that the team, even before I got to Metro, has been looking for sites. It's not easy to find a location in central Washington uh, in this area of the city that's large enough and located in a, in a um, reasonable distance from our bus routes to, to even accommodate this use. So we have searched, uh, as we talked about in the presentation, uh, we've evaluated many other sites, um, but determined that they were not feasible for this use. And I think, um, you know, Lord and Taylor closed in the pandemic. It went bankrupt and closed its doors. And so we have a vacant uh, retail space in the neighborhood and a parking lot that is also vacant um, that is, is not currently being used. And we determined that was the best, um, you know, most feasible path. It's also adjacent to our current operation. So locationally, it's it's well suited. Um, and so that is the reason we have, we have moved forward in that direction. Yeah, the gentleman in the khaki. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Taladine Lukda. I'm with Northern Bus Barn Neighbors. Uh, I had a question. Uh, I think it's more in your wheelhouse, Liz. Um, late last year, or early this year, WMATA went before the Zoning Commission and requested a uh, an amendment uh, to the comp plan that would allow for the development of the Western Garage area. I'm assuming, and I was going to testify at that hearing, but I got sick and it just wasn't worth me getting out my bed to try to offer testimony. So I'm, I'm not going to give you testimony now, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do want to ask this. The 2020 comp plan, one of the beauties of it, uh, particularly for myself, is that there is a racial equity component that has now been attached to the comp plan. And I'm trying to understand Coming from the Northern Garage, where we've been working close to four years, and they just started demoing last week. I'm trying to understand how that racial equity component works for Northern versus Western, because it's not up there now, but if you turn to slide 11, everything, everything that's on slide 11 is what we asked for at Northern. We didn't get it. And I'm trying to understand what the difference is between my million dollar house in Ward 4 and a million dollar house in Ward 3. I think you're referring to the interest in having housing as well as part of that project. Yeah, Was that part of it? Going, you know, yeah. the, the housing, and, and that's a part of, yeah. and, and it's not what I'm asking for. It is what the 2012 small area plan that was voted on by the council, that it calls for that housing and for which is retail. And that was from 2012. And the recommendation was made then in that report. And I think you all are doing the Wisconsin Avenue one. The, the Office of Plan, plan Office of the, Planning, yes. Uh, yeah, so we went through that. We went through it in 2010, 2011 unanimously approved by the council, but what we asked for is not what we're getting. And so I'm trying to understand, you know, a pretty smart guy. 
you know, I'm just trying to understand what what's different. I mean, you know, so uh, two so two things. One, I would just say that. Um, we're at the early stages here too, and so we're exploring if we can accommodate housing and other uses. And there's a lot of uh, deliberation in front of us, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of structurally, what can we accommodate? Um, what are the financial implications um, for, for additional development above and around it? So we are exploring it. Um, we haven't confirmed that we can do it, but that is our goal is to figure out if it's possible and bring that back to this community. Um, this predates me that the northern discussions that you're talking about, but I have, you know, my team has talked to me about this in the past. I think we did pursue um, development interest in that site, um, but for various reasons, they determined it wasn't feasible, whether it was the zoning issues or the timing risk because the project was delayed or or there were other things that um, dissuaded the developers from moving forward. Diesel buses. Diesel buses probably Diesel didn't, buses. didn't help. Diesel buses and that particular project, Ramada wanted a relocation of North. So the developer would have to have bring a site, yeah. a suitable place, yeah. close by, right. and then they were willing to sell the property to develop. So that's a really good point because that's another complexity of that site because it, you know we had to move all the operations in order to do the work on site because it was you know, historic and it had to come back to that location. Here, we have a little bit more flexibility because we're identifying a site separate from our current one that we can plan for and, and think about and not trying to do it all on the same site at the same time. So there are some you know, very different, both in terms of time and condition and market, um, but I know we did look at that, um, but it was determined by the, by the development community that it was not gonna be feasible. Fortunately, you were before you got here. <laughs> Lots of things were before I got here. I just got here. <laughs> Thank you. We have a few questions online, so I will pass it to David. Okay, uh, Peter Beer Speaker says uh, the current garage supports 117 buses. How many buses would they propose new garage service initially and ultimately? So, again, it's one of those things that's not fully vetted out yet because there are many things as we talk about the different zero emission technologies that are available. Um, whether it's electric or others, um, we don't fully, the industry doesn't fully understand what all of the requirements, spacing, so on and so forth, for, related to safety are, is going to be required for the facility. So the, the want, the desire is to have about 120, right in the same range, no more, um, but we haven't, we haven't quite finalized what, what, what it's going to actually be because there's a lot of complexities. And another online question? Uh, Nome asks, uh, you mentioned rezoning. Can you please outline the zoning issues? Yeah, I can talk to that. Um, there will be um, a zoning text amendment and map amendment needed um, to bring this site, uh, as well as other sites in the neighborhood, in uh, alignment with the new um, comp plan that was um, passed by council last year or the year before. <laughs> Losing track. Um, as well as a text amendment, which would allow the bus garage to occupy any portion of the site um, so that we can think um, you know, more flexibly about how to accommodate the, the garage and also potentially other uses. <clears throat> For you to uh, coordinate with the work the Office of Planning is doing, because they are coming up with some very interesting ideas uh, or both that involve both the old and the new sites here. Yeah, we are coordinating very closely with our cons and, and OP um, as part of the framework study and, and they with us. So we're, we are already working closely with them and we'll continue to do so. Well, I think um, the DC Office of Planning has their own community engagement um, plan and meetings for the framework plan. I know there was one in December I don't know if there's others coming up that we should be <laughs> promoting. Um, so, and then we're gonna have our own so that you can dive in a little deeper to our facilities and our plans, um, but those will be going on simultaneously and we're coordinating um, amongst the agencies directly ourselves. Do we have another online question? Yes. Uh, so David Frankel asks, uh, is the NEPA review just for the Lord and Taylor site or also for the existing Wisconsin Avenue site? Okay. 
just the Lord, I'm not the NEPA expert, uh, just the Lord and Taylor site. Uh, and then Jonathan Bender asked, why was the Geico site rejected? Um, again, it was evaluated, um, but it wasn't so much that it was rejected, but it, Lord and Taylor was deemed to be a better location um, and a better fit for our needs. Um, so it, How long ago was the Geico site evaluated? Pre-COVID? Um, Pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. So, the conditions have changed. I don't think um, it changes the fact that Lord and Taylor is a vacant property with no so current Lord use. Taylor was still a Burlington Prairie. Would it still be the best site? Um, that yeah. would have probably changed our calculus significantly, yeah. for sure. Okay. Okay. So it got selected because it was convenient and available. Not, not only, Taylor. not only. I mean, we have, there's many many no, because you said it was a uniform shape but it's no more uniform shape the lord and taylor property than the existing plus plus it is equally oddly shaped it may have a larger rectangular footprint mm -hmm. available but it, it is not a uniform shape like the current site is also not a vacant but beside the map that you showed no it looks it looks better it's a better it's more it's more uniform i'll say it's more uniform it's not uniform there's probably no right angles in washington but um yes it is yeah i i would say um there are many factors um but for sure um the the confluence of those factors at lord and taylor it's not one thing um but for sure um the changes in the pandemic um have made it possible for us to um take this step and to be more um assertive, um, which we think is helpful because it helps us move this project forward. If we don't have a site, there's no bus garage. It's going to be diesel and open air until we can get to something better. We have some more in-person questions. Thank you. <clears throat> I had a question. Oh, I have two questions. The first being, um, I had a question about um, or to highlight the difference between a zero emission bus facility that would be a, a zero emission facility that has a part of it being zero emission buses or a facility that just houses zero emission buses. So I think you clarified that the point of this slide is saying that it is, will be a facility designed for zero emission buses, but to what extent are you considering the design elements to make it a zero emission facility, such as no gas being run to it, heating on site, water heating on site, not being gas powered, and then again, in the trend in DC in the legislative landscape is that there is not only going to be goals creeping up very quickly for emissions reductions, but also net zero energy codes. So what type of solar design is going to this storage, any type of making this a modern energy efficient facility that is a zero emission facility. And I'll probably have more to say about that in the coming meetings. And I understand it's premature from a design phase, but I wanted to flag that now because we learned last week that Northern Bus Barn is going to have zero emission buses, but still going to have low pressure gas lines for the boiler and for the water heating. Yes. The second question, which is quick, is and I just want to confirm that the 117 buses that are at the current facility, the plan is to have them operating as long as possible and try and seamlessly get them to the new facility. Because I thought I heard you mention that they might be moved to another facility in the interim. No, um, I'll answer that one first. Um, the 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 plan is to build a new facility mm -hmm. um close one and open the other i'm sure it won't work quite that easily right right but that's the idea and so there's no downtime for service there's no impacts on operations minimal cost so what i might have said was for northern um the gentleman was speaking of northern we did have to you know relocate the buses mm -hmm. because we had to build on that site um but we are not you know that's one of the advantages of, of picking a, an off-site location and then to the other, I appreciate the comments. I mean, we have not gotten to that point in our studies, but I think it's a great point to raise and something um, certainly we'll be looking at. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question in the front. You mentioned that the buses would recharge through a pantograph. <coughs> Can you assure us that it will not require the kind of continuous stanchions and wires that the streetcar system along Benning Road has required. 
the latest uh, technologies for streetcars do permit recharging at the stops. How did these buses recharge, or is the battery technology now such that uh, you can make your full round trip and not have to recharge? So making, making a full round trip depends on many, many factors. Um, and the technology continues to evolve rapidly. There's, there's an electric bus that's there at Western now that, that is from 2016 and does not make it very far. Buses of today are very different. Um, for charging, um, a bus is very different than what you see on 8th Street with the streetcars. And so the idea of Canton area lines, the, the power lines that run up and down the street, that, that's not what's considered for electric buses. They're meant to be able to operate independently uh, for a period of time with, with no, no connection to infrastructure. Um, so I, I, now, with that said, though, again, the zero emission technology is is evolving at a very, very rapid rate. And so, you know, well, yes, we talk about electric buses today, but there could be other technologies in the future that we just don't, you know, the industry has not moved far enough yet. Um, there, there are others out there, but again, I don't, I don't want to go and, and pinpoint just one, what you will be, what you have heard from us and, and you hear from many other transit agencies is much talk about battery electric. Um, so again, to your concern, no catenary lines, it won't be like streetcar. Um, there could be charging infrastructure on street, but that's a separate discussion. We have not really uh, gotten far enough along with that either yet. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, we're, right now we're talking about at the facility and at the facility only, and not something that would be out in the community or I sort to the community. Thank you. We have a question in the back. Um, one new set of things I've heard tonight is a lot of other alternatives that might have been considered or that since you haven't purchased the property, it could be considered. Um, I get the sense that you have been looking for things to achieve your objectives without very much considering alternative objectives that the community might have. Housing is one of those. And uh, it seems to me that what you, it would be very useful to know um, how all those other interests can be accommodated or may lead you to another alternative. There's been a lot of talk about Geico and other things that actually could solve a lot of problems. Uh, you back up into existing housing with your plan um, if you were across Western Avenue, you wouldn't do that. And that would, the space that you want to buy could be opened up to a lot more housing to the community, which I think is a community priority. Uh, how can we as a community get those alternatives on the table so that there's a rational discussion about what's the best use of this land given the competing priorities? Well, I would say we have we put on our list of priorities is to explore how we can um, bring other uses to this project, um, if, if at all possible. So we are interested to hear from you tonight, as well as you know throughout this process, as to what the community would like to see as part of this project. And we're going to be investigating um, how and if we can accommodate other uses. So I think it, I don't think that we're um, not aligned in that in that interest and in exploration. Thank you. We have another question. Oh. Um, well, my name is Michael Beer, I'm a, a local resident. Uh, curious if you've looked at <clears throat> Montgomery County just did a new bus facility, um, similarly trying to move to uh, I renovated the current one, trying to move to electric, put in a good amount of solar, basically created a microgrid, did it through a PPA. Um, pretty innovative project when I toured and, and saw what they were able to do there. But I'm wondering if that's in, in your vision at all here, possibility something you're considering. The surprising thing is a few hours ago, we were having a, a discussion a discussion about our future. Um, and, you know, it's wide open for what we decide to do. And, and, the, and Amy helped me out, but 2045, 
in, in, in 2030, we, we, we hope to be able to improve on that. But, you know, there are, there's, it's going to take a lot to get us there. And so we're going to have to be re real uh, creative. Montgomery County and what they did at the Brookville uh, location is something that's been very innovative um, um, and something that's being considered. Um, you know, you, you go to other parts of the country and everybody has their own little flavor. Um, but I, I, th I think for us, again, 2045 may seem like a long time away. It's not really. Um, and there's a lot of work that we have to do and we're gonna have to be real creative in, in how we go about doing it. So. I love it. I, um, <clears throat> I think we're, you know, blessing and it's really like just around, around the country. That Montgomery one is probably one of the most innovative that the Agreed. future of the country is, is really going to next year. Yep. Thank you, we have a question on the side. <clears throat> My question to follow up on an earlier question is, what planning has been done to clean up the contamination at the current Ramada site in the event that that bus garage were to move from that site? Yeah, I think um, there there were some conditions in the past that have been remediated in, in consultation with the district and um, are being monitored. Um, but as part of the due diligence as we go forward, we'll be documenting um, the site conditions uh, and then evaluating what, if any, further work needs to be done before we can develop the site. For sure, that'll be important. And if I could just have one more. And is there a reason, um, or what would the reasons be um, for um, requiring uh, the contiguous planning for, for just one site? Um, it, it, as we've been talking, it does seem that there would be other possibilities. Um, I mentioned earlier the home plate lot and um, it, it putting more than one parcels together. Of course, the Geico would be one contiguous one potentially. But I guess my question more is about, um, uh, and the gentleman uh, also mentioned earlier about the size of 44, that they wouldn't be contiguous. And so, um, is there some force, uh, some requirement, some, some you know, deeper thinking about why it has to be all in one place? Yeah, I think um, it's really going to be driven by operational considerations and safety. Um, and so we'll be focusing on the technical needs of the operational uh, team as we go into the concept design phase. So I think we can speak more to that when we come back, um, but certainly moving buses back and forth across different yeah. sites. Um, just, I think, probably creates other um, challenges or concerns. It, it's something we're actually doing right now uh, for the Blatonsburg bus garage as part of that construction. We have a temporary lot that's located maybe roughly a mile, less than a mile away, away from the actual garage, which uh, for that particular community, it means more traffic, uh, which we would like to try to avoid in addition to the delays it creates and, and being able to you know, make sure that we're getting buses um, uh, service in an efficient manner, in the most efficient manner that we can. Thank you. We're going to take a few online questions. Okay. Um, Arnold Burke asks, uh, does the property that will be acquired include the Lord and Taylor building or only the Lord and Taylor parking area behind the building? We're looking at the entire parcel. Okay. Uh, Elise Gray Parker asks, will the new proposed site have space for Metro employee parking as well? I would just say that that is something that we're going to look at in the next phase, which is part of the technical requirements, what is needed um, and, and how will that be accommodated? So there'll be more on that in the next phase. Edward Hoyt asks, uh, what electrical infrastructure upgrades will be required for the new garage to be able to handle electrical loading from charging the buses. So that that's again something that we don't have a complete answer on just yet. There's uh, smart charging. There's you know, in some early discussions we wanted to have every single bus connected up to a charger, but need to answer the question if if that really is efficient, if that makes sense, if if all parties can actually uh, meet those those type of demands. Um, we do hope with the, we don't hope, <laughs> with our first uh, uh, buses that will be arriving uh, this year, 60 foot buses down to Shepherd Parkway, we hope to learn a lot, improve the technology, um, and test out some things that will help reduce the amount of power we actually need. Thank you. Um, 
we have one uh, audience member that has their hand raised. Uh, so I am going to, it's Nancy. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a follow up to something that was brought up a little bit earlier, but from what I've seen about the redevelopment plan for Friendship Heights, uh, given that this is the heart of Chevy Chase, I so I assumed that the parking garage was being that the bus facility was being located somewhere else entirely. That it appears to be rather incompatible with the other plans that I've seen for Friendship Heights, which is all housing and retail with a focus on residential. So it's hard. It, it seems like such an incompatible site in the heart of Chevy Chase. I would just say that, you know, this buses have been part of this neighborhood for, for over a hundred years. Um, and we're looking to bring, you know, keep in this community um, a transit facility, but bring it up to modern standards and make it a better neighbor. Uh, by putting it in a structure, by transitioning to zero emission, and also exploring other opportunities for mixed use. So we we believe that there's a path for a compatible, continued compatible relationship. And the activities at the um, that that are the area where the buses converge in Friendship Heights right now would be relocated, I assume. Are you speaking of the bus loop? Yeah. At two Wisconsin Circle, um, that dis that decision has not been made. Um, we understand. I mean, that facility is also um, challenged from a space and operational perspective. So we have we are looking at that, uh, and we'll be bringing more information about that forward. But there's been no determination whether that would be part of this facility or or continue to be separate. Thank you, Nancy. Any other questions online? Uh, yes, Alexandra uh, Giano asks, uh, how many years will it take for the buses to all be moved to a new site? Uh, how many years until the community might see some benefits regarding the use of the old building? And will it be a uh, brownfield once Wilmata vacates? Uh, a brownfield once Wilmata vacates? Um, yeah, as we mentioned in the presentation, our intent is to um, offer the, the current site for redevelopment once we've ceased operations. Um, it's very early days, um, so, um, but we did show a, a slide here that said, um, you know, we think it's feasible, it's possible that we could be constructing the new garage in the 26 to 2030 timeframe, uh, which would make the current site available for redevelopment uh, after that period, uh, once we've opened the new garage. Thank you. Any questions in person? Yes. You just mentioned offering the site for redevelopment and, and so my question was if you know once if you build a new garage is, is it is it the intent that wamata would develop the old site or that you would sell it to a developer to develop the old site yeah great question um wamata does not um typically develop uh or, or construct things that are not transit related so we typically sell or lease land to private developers who would then um, bring other uses to the site so um, we coordinate that very closely uh, to the extent that there's existing or continuing transit uses, whether it's the station entrance or other facilities, but that would be um, that would be led by the private sector. Yeah, you can go next. Um, I'm really excited about the prospect of bringing zero emissions, a fully zero emissions bus garage to this neighborhood, and I think I think that's a terrific step forward. Um, I'm also really excited about the prospect of using this space for affordable housing, and I know that's still uh, in the future there, but I'm curious if you might be able to tell us a little bit about how you might be able to work with other entities that can help with funding. You mentioned in particular the funding challenges of doing something like that. Are you talking to Amazon and the Housing Equity Fund, for example? Maybe you could just elaborate on that a little. Sure. Um, I'll just maybe back up for a little for, for some folks. So um, WMATA operates in, in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, as you know, each jurisdiction has their own affordable housing requirements. And so our policy is to abide by whatever the local requirements are. So any of our projects, um, wherever they sit, they will meet whatever uh, the jurisdiction requires in terms of affordable housing. So for this location, inclusionary zoning would be the standard. 
Um, we are, um, we have in many cases worked with um, local jurisdictions and, and communities to identify additional goals for additional uh, affordable housing. Um, and then we need to work with those jurisdictions and others to identify, as you said, funding sources to support that. Um, so one example of that um, is Amazon, which came to us about a year and a half ago and funded um, $125 million um, to be dedicated to make um, projects at metro stations um, more uh, to increase affordability. And so in the first year, um, we've announced that we've spent all their money. <laughs> uh, we're, we'd love to get more, but um, so we've, we've in the, we have in the pipeline over a thousand units um, as a result of that investment. So that exceed, that pushed our own affordable housing um, delivery at our projects to, to a much greater level. So that's the kind of partnership we'd love to see. Uh, it doesn't have to just be Amazon. There are other corporate citizens we hope will, will follow suit. Um, and of course, we're talking to the district and will be, um, the district has a you know, very sophisticated um, affordable housing toolkit uh, and a real commitment to expanding housing affordability in the city. So um, we'll certainly be working with them to talk about what their goals are and how we can work together. Thank you, another question. Hi, I have two questions. One, have you thought about what you would do if for some reason this property does get designated as historic? And two, if the zero emission buses are gonna plan to be here starting in 2030, wouldn't the procurement process for those have to start already? And if so, has it started? Do I handle procurement? Sure, so, no <laughs> so, so the procurements have already started. Um, in fact, we have, again, I mentioned that we have two 60 foot electric buses that are coming, of course, that's designated for right now for Shepherd Parkway. Um, we have, we hope to be able to announce the award of 10 40 foot electric buses uh, very soon <laughs> uh, with options for additional, additional buses. Um, and I'm very happy to, to, to say that we have a five year sustained procurement. And, and that's where for me, it becomes really, it becomes real because we've talked about testing evaluation in the past. Um, but with that particular one is our sustained procurement. It has electric, bus, uh, electric buses specced out in that as well. Um, it hasn't quite hit the street yet, um, but we hope to get that out there fairly soon. And on historic, I'll just say um, in the next phase when we're presenting initial concepts, we'll look at different ideas about how um, the historic treatment of that facade or building could could impact our design. So we'll we'll have more to share on that soon. I think you just clarified it. I don't want to break news. No, <laughs> I, I mean I, there's been no decision made on what, if any, portion of the site is would be designated historic. That's still to be determined. Oh, okay. So I'm just saying we'll look at different ways um, we could address uh, the historic questions uh, and its impact on design as well as operations. Question in the front. Yeah, I can project. <laughs> um, in the initial uh, drawings you'll show us, concept plans, will there be housing either wrapping it or on top of the building? We're not there yet, but we are going to, in, in the next phase, before we come back to you, we will have done more work and we'll be able to show you what we think is possible or feasible or the implications of, of right. different choices. We build a lot of things underground, like tunnels and yeah. metros. Uh, and the other question is, is there a possibility, and this may be a real estate or development question, of um, connecting the air rights over the new facility to the development on Wisconsin Avenue? as an adjunct, the PUDs can be on either side of a street. So it could be something that's, let's say, unburdened from you, but made part of a very juicy site on Wisconsin Avenue, just as a thought. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly something we can look at, but not that we've done so far. Thank you. We have a few questions online, so I'll pass it to David. Okay, Thomas Sinks asks, is Metro planning to abandon or sell off the current site or to incorporate it into the future design? Again, we're still entering sort of the technical uh, phase and the, and the concept design phase, but um, it's our expectation that we will not need it for bus service uh, in the future once a new garage is built, uh, and then that would become a mixed-use development opportunity. 
Okay. He also asked a follow up is Metro considering purchasing the small commercial property on 44th across from the current garage. Yeah, I think somebody asked that earlier and um, so you know we've determined that we need um, the Lord and Taylor site and we're just starting concept design if there's further needs um, identified in the future we'll address it at that time, but at this time we have not identified that. Okay, uh, Kathy Chen asks, uh, how will you protect or buffer the surrounding neighborhoods with the move of the bus station closer into residential neighborhoods. Uh, in terms of bus traffic in and out, lights at night, noise, safety for kids and family, walking, playing in the streets, daily traffic jams already on Western Avenue, and general undesirability of living much closer to a bus station. So we'll be um, exploring all of those issues in the next phase. You know, how do, as you said, how do you get to the site safely? Um, how does it transition? Um, to other parts of the neighborhood. So our concepts, uh, initial concepts, we'll start to look at that and we'll have a chance to talk about, uh, you know, the opportunities, the challenges, the feedback that you all have to that, and that will help us further refine um, the options. Uh, and this is a multi-part question. Uh, this is from Russell. Can you explain how it's zero emissions bus garage if you're going to move the current diesel buses over? And does that mean you'll guarantee the new facility won't open until you're fully replaced the 120 buses with all electric? So just to, to go back to what our GM has said about um, and related to Northern, you know, if it, even if it means just five buses at, at, at the opening day, that that's what it means. Um, there are logistics and how we move the uh, vehicles around. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, we, we, we have to keep them for 15 years, but um, the intent, again, very clearly, it won't have diesel infrastructure in it, so we won't be able to properly service those type of vehicles in this new facility that we're, that we're talking about. And uh, as a follow-up to, to the question, Russell also asked, please also address your current plan to have entry from 44th right by a residential street with many young kids. Uh, this is not a safe entry or egress point. Yeah, I would just say that there's been no decision about where the entry is, so I'm not sure where that comment came from, but um, we will be exploring um, what the options are and the, and the pros and cons of each, um, and we'll share more when we have the concepts. I have two more in the queue here. Uh, Kathy Chen asks, how will you all protect or buffer? Oh, actually, this might be a repeat question. Um, okay, Alexandra asks, uh, if the old site is not vacated until 2030 and is a brownfield, uh, then the old site may not be inhabitable until 2035, 2040. Please answer the brownfield question. Will the existing site be a brownfield once WMATA vacates? So I think, um, as we said earlier, um, we're going to be evaluating the conditions um, and, and we'll share more when we have it. I, I can't say that it's a brownfield or what, what remediation may or may not be needed um, at this point. Um, but our intent is with many urban sites in Washington, D.C. that have historical legacy uses, that this will have a second life as a different use. Any questions in person? It, it sounds as if you've been working on this for several years and that your initial study must have been conducted in terms of the bus needs and that sort of thing pre COVID. And I would assume that you know the world's a very different place and it will continue to evolve, as we can see from the empty you know, commercial real estate downtown and that sort of thing. Have you conducted studies to the same degree, you know, of the same size? as you did early on when you were first exploring this since COVID or recently projecting now into the future? About bus capacity, like what's gonna be needed there? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's an ongoing conversation, very active, but I'll let you. Yeah, one, one thing you heard from Mr. Hams earlier was just we, we have a, another, the Better Bus uh, yeah, uh, better study. Bus 
and with the intent of looking at the entire region and what needs are not just for well for, for bus service throughout the region. So there's ongoing things that that are that are occurring to make sure that we are you know appropriately sizing and appropriately replacing um, our vehicles where they need to be to to best service the communities. Is it possible then with those studies that you'll determine that your bus needs aren't as great or are changed in some way that could impact the sites that you're selecting or the, the options that you might want to explore? So I, 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 again, I don't, I don't want to be too forward, forward thinking, but you know, when, when you think about the routes that are run from, from uh, Western today, school, school the, the, the particular lines that are run out of there, they are heavy hauling in demand routes. We, we don't anticipate, you correct me if I'm wrong, we don't anticipate that to change. Yes. <laughs> and, and bus ridership, um, we talked about this earlier, um, has retained, has, has maintained higher levels of, of um, use throughout the pandemic and, and today than rail. So I think the, the demand for bus has been, has been pretty strong. Next question. Hi, I'm Roger. I live in the neighborhood a few blocks away. I want to counter the undesirability comment that was online. My young son loves the buses. They're professional. They're safer than the other people that are driving around. They're, they're skilled. I love bumping into my bus driver at Bowie Mongers, please. I mean, don't go away. This, this is a, you guys are a great company. We want you in our neighborhood. We want you activating our retail. The buses are great. Please don't go. This is a great site on top of a beautiful metro station. Your employees can come easily. We can bump into them in the elevator. Please don't go. I'll just add that, you know, as a former student at what's now Jackson Reed, you know, I used to ride the 30s up and down from one side of the town to the other in, in Tillingtown and visiting Boogie Mongers in, in Friendship Heights. Um, you know, the, the hope is to, again, as, as, as previously shared, you know, be a good community member. Um, that's the reason for why we're here um, and continue to evolve the system and make sure that we're not, maybe not on the bleeding edge, but just again, making sure that we're advancing and, and, and again, a good good steward to the community. Thank you. Thank you, we have a question in the back. Hi, Jim Curtin again. And uh, just to follow up on Rob Roger, Roger's comment, um, and I've asked some, you know, questions already tonight. I don't want to monopolize it, but I don't want you to misunderstand my questions as being kind of offered as as a, an expression of opposition at all. Um, I mean, I, I've lived in the neighborhood almost right on top of the bus barn uh, for 40 years, and um, you know, it's been a good neighbor. Uh, I think the prospect of a state of the art world-class facility that's zero emission with no environmental impact uh, on the neighborhood uh, is an appealing upgrade. Um, you know, if, if, if we had a time machine and uh, we're going to redesign the whole city, maybe people would say, you know, maybe this isn't the best spot for a bus barn, but, you know, it's been there for a long time. We've all been here for a long time. And if we can have a better bus barn, maybe that's a, a, net, a net win. Uh, I guess my, just my kind of sincere request on behalf of myself anyway, is that if we're going to have a new bus barn, that it be world class, you know, and that it be developed after giving, you know, all thoughtful consideration to the site um, and how the entire site, uh, all the parcels we've talked about today can be creatively used and whatever technology can be used to kind of build the best facility uh, so that it can be a show place, you know, and uh, not just kind of something we end up settling for because we didn't have the vision or the finances to make it better. So. Thank you. That's appreciate Thank that. You.
And we had one question on the side. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my understanding is that the owners of the Lauren Taylor lot also own the empty parking lot across the street. Is that part of the negotiation? Are you acquiring that lot as well? No, that's the home plate lot that yeah. someone referred to earlier. Um, no, we are not. That is not part of our uh, acquisition. So that could potentially be developed ahead of anything that you guys do. Yes. Thank you. We have a few online questions. Okay. Thomas Sinks asks, if the current bus pickup site on Wisconsin is shifted to this new site, wouldn't it make sense to redevelop the current garage into a new pickup site because of its proximity to the rail? So um, um, we are looking at the operations and the future needs of the bus loop, and we'll be considering all of that as in the months ahead. Okay. Uh, Aaron Mohibi uh, asks, where can we find out when and where the next community meeting will be held? <laughs> well, we are going to have these quarterly. This is our kickoff meeting, and we're going to stay engaged. So you can sign up for our, our newsletter. I will show that in a coming slide, how you can sign up on our webpage. And then we'll also have um, just digital opportunities for you to engage and learn more about upcoming events. Thank you. Okay. Should uh, we put that slide up on the screen? Yeah. Just so we, okay. Thank you. Thank you for having a meeting where people can speak so we can hear from each other. You're welcome. I have one more question, I think. Uh, okay, Friendship Heights does not have a community center or a place for adults and kids to engage in a makerspace. Because a makerspace would need specialized equipment and an industrial type space, is it something that might be considered in the development of this garage phase? This is from Sid Edelman. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is what we want to hear from you all now and at the next meeting, sort of what um, what are the needs and desires from the community and how this project, you know, could consider uh, incorporating those. We, we have not looked at any specific uses, but um, this is the kind of information we'd like to hear from you. Do we have any more online? Okay, I think we have one question. That's right. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. I think we have one last question on the side. Uh, yes, uh, John Goodman, and my question is, uh, people have danced around the Geico site a lot, and uh, is that site even a potentially available one? If, if Geico has no intention of selling it, then that's one, is that the reason it's a non-starter, or in fact, is it uh, potentially available? Um, it is, from my understanding, it's not available. It's, they're not interested in selling, um, and that is one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. I could ask for that too. It, from our neighborhood in Brookdale, we're right there next to Geico. Um, they have a development plan that was extended. I don't think, I think it has finally expired, but it was developed and negotiated with the neighborhood around there, and we were going to get a baseball field, and they were going to use two large office buildings and then apartments on Willard and Town Home uh, where the parking lot is, but they have not proceeded with that development plan. And it may have now expired. But that was on the board of them for at least 15 years. One last question, yes. Well, 
Well, thank you everyone for joining on behalf of Metro. We are so excited to be hosting our first of many kickoffs, of first of many meetings that we'll be able to engage and you can ask questions and we can respond. So as we talk about next steps, I just wanna draw your attention really quickly. We do have a quarterly e-newsletter. You'll get a link to that in the thank you email after this meeting. So feel free to sign up there. We'll also develop concepts and themes. I know a lot of people had questions about designs and we'll bring that in future meetings. You can also sign up for updates if you go to our website for this specific project, wmata.com backslash Western Bus Garage. Again, wmata.com backslash Western Bus Garage. You can find more information there. And then last but not least, we are gonna have another community event meeting in the spring. So again, we'll be engaging everyone. We'll be advertising that. So we look forward to seeing you.